Thanks very much, JB. It's, uh, thanks to all of you for coming as well. I know there are many other things you could be doing uh, as spring draws nigh with the, <laughs> and, uh, uh, the Twin Cities, and I appreciate your uh, coming out on a uh, Friday midday. This is a, it's an interesting thing to be a, uh, uh, introduced like that by somebody who knows you and has a, has a past. I had forgotten all about those crossings uh, in, outside Nixon Elementary School years ago, but indeed they did happen, and I, I don't recall ever defending the virtues or the moral values of those occasions either. Um, uh, earlier this week, as the temperatures plunged to single digits, only briefly in South Bend, I was telling uh, colleagues I was getting out of, out of town later in the week, I said, oh gosh, lucky for you, that's so great, where are you going? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How bad is it there? I said, you don't want to know. In any case, it's a, it's a delight to be here. I'm very grateful, as I said, for your presence and, and very much looking forward to uh, sharing a little bit with you about my book. Uh, as JB said, I know some of you have read it. My apologies uh, to those who have read it and, and may find much of what I'm going to say here an even more hope, uh, hopelessly compressed version of the narrative that I offer already in uh, a very dense way in, in the book. Those of you who have not read it, though, I hope that perhaps the talk today will inspire you to do so. Uh, there's still plenty of shopping time before Christmas, and I hear the book makes a great gift. So <laughs> without further ado, in terms of both its method and its scope, The Unintended Reformation is a book that will interest more than historians of the Reformation or the history of Christianity. Its main objective is straightforward, albeit ambitious, to explain how things came to be as they are, institutionally and ideologically in the contemporary Western world, or, depending on the nomenclature that you prefer, in North America, and especially those areas of Europe that in the Middle Ages were part of Latin Christendom. I know it's a very pedantic, but more precise formulation of the Western world. Although I am a historian of early modern Europe, in this book, I take the present as my point of departure in a study that is as much about the present as it is about the past. Explaining how the past became the present is, I take it, one of the things that historians are expected to do. But it might seem a rather strange undertaking for a historian chiefly concerned with the very dead of the 16th and the 17th centuries. What have they to do with the political realities, the global capitalism, moral debates, intellectual concerns, and social problems of the early 21st century? Aren't we supposed to stay in our own fields? So let me start by saying something about my approach and my method in the book. Fields, as historians ordinarily define them, are trained in them, and use them to tackle their division of labor, are well suited to try to answer many questions about the past. But I've come to think that paradoxically, they actually inhibit attempts to answer the basic historical question of how the world as we know it today came to be as it is. There seem to me to be two fundamental reasons for this. First, despite the vogue, recent vogue, for global and transnational history, and I know the University of Minnesota has been a pioneer in this respect, historians tend to distinguish fields according to chronological period, national or regional focus, and type of history. So that historians are usually trained and do what they do, say, as social historians of medieval England, or cultural historians of the antebellum American South, or political historians of colonial West Africa, and so forth. Obviously, this is a practical necessity, given the complexity of the past and the unmanageable superabundance of surviving sources. One can't read and master everything, or even very much. But as we know, this doesn't alter the fact that many historical realities transcend national boundaries, and that human life is always lived as an interconnected whole not in convenient separate compartments for historians, labeled politics and culture or economics. No serious account of how the present came to be as it is could rely on just one or two of these domains on which historians tend to concentrate. Culture or capitalism, ideas or institutions, social relationships or science. Anyone who wants to try to explain then how the past became the present has to try to incorporate multiple domains because of their combined explanatory power. And this is a corollary of their interrelated historical influence. How to do this, though, in an intellectually responsible and persuasive way presents enormous challenges. This goes as well for historians of Christianity, insofar as religion is always lived in concrete contexts by flesh and blood human beings in social and political relationships.
I sought to address this in my book through six linked narratives, each of which opens with a description of something important about the present, and then asks how it came about, starting with the late Middle Ages and emphasizing the transformative character of the Reformation era. I start with the institutionalized worldview of late medieval Christianity in my book, looking back where necessary to earlier medieval centuries and indeed to the ancient world in a manner consistent with my genealogical methodology. Because Western Europe on the eve of the Reformation is how far back in time we need to go in order to explain how and why the world in which we're living in today came to be as it is. That's my contention in the book. As a many layered, locally diversified, institutionalized worldview that had been unsystematically built up over centuries, late medieval Latin Christianity sought to shape all of life's domains and it influenced them all, for good or ill. Hence, the Reformation's challenge to and rejection of the authority of the Roman Church was bound to affect all of these domains, a fact reflected in the range of issues analyzed in the book's six chapters. Simply to indicate them the main issues briefly, chapter one, excluding God, explores the relationship among religion, science, and metaphysics, and how deadlocked theological controversies contributed to modern philosophical discourses about God in relationship to the emergence of modern science. The second chapter, Relativizing Doctrines, concentrates on the bases for truth claims about human values and meaning since the Reformation, the two most important novel bases being the Bible and reason alone. Chapter three is called Controlling the Churches, and it focuses on the institutional locus of the public exercise of power and the emergence of monopolistic state sovereignty. The next chapter is Subjectivizing Morality, which analyzes the transformation of moral discourse and moral behavior from a substantive ethics of the good to a formal ethics of rights in relationship to political institutions. Chapter five is entitled Manufacturing the Goods Life. It's the only clever chapter title. And it treats, the, I think it's clever, never mind. And it treats the relationship among human desires, acquisitiveness, consumption, and capitalism. The final chapter, Secularizing Knowledge, addresses the relationship between higher education and assumptions about the making and transmission of knowledge. In order to explain how the world we're living in today came to be as it is, we need not only to include religion, science, philosophy, institutions, power, morality, <coughs> economics, and higher education, but also to try to understand their relationships to one another. The respective domains of life addressed in each chapter are analytically distinguished in the hope of fostering increased insight, and not because each was lived in isolation from the other. So the book is structured as six long-term narratives that are simultaneously distinguished from and related to one another as strands in what is intended as a single explanatory account. The fact that each chapter starts in the late Middle Ages and runs through the Reformation era to the present is related to the second reason why historical fields as ordinarily constituted fall short in explaining the character of the present. In a word, changes that occurred in the distant past remain influential today, although they tend not to be recognized as such because of the chronological division of labor among historians and the conception of change over time that it presupposes. Most historians, and indeed people in general, it seems to me, regardless of the period studied, are taught to believe that accounting for the present is a task that falls to modernists. Historians of the pre-modern past are specialists in reconstructing and rendering its otherness, an alterity only confirmed in proportion to their immersion in their sources. Modernists share this aspiration in their respective ways, but they are also expected to explain how that otherness became the familiar present, an expectation that seems to have increased in recent years in proportion to the unprecedented pace of change driven by technology and globalization. In Daniel Lord Smale's words, the flattening of history, or the telescoping of historical time, has been accompanied by a sense that history has begun to withdraw from an engagement with its deeper past, as history has become confused with modernity. The underlying assumption here is that the distant past was so different that knowledge of it is essentially dispensable for those whose objective it is to understand the ever more transformed present. 
The same assumption, incidentally, tends to characterize a great deal of scholarship in most of the social sciences, certainly most sociology, psychology, economics, and political science. So Reformation historians, for example, surely need to understand the late medieval period in order to understand the 16th century historical realities in which they are primarily interested, but 20th century American historians supposedly do not. This seems to make sense, even aside from the accelerated rapidity of change in recent dec decades, given the radical transformations wrought by the shift from a primarily agrarian to an industrial economy in Western Europe and North America in the past two centuries, together with the solidification of powerful bureaucratic states and a demographic trend away from rural and toward urban societies. The dramatic transformations wrought by the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, industrialization, and modern capitalism separate us from them. Hence the seeming justification for typical schemes of historical periodization reflected as well in the ordinary division of labor among the co-authors of Western and World Civ textbooks, in which medievalists hand the baton to the early modernists, who then deliver it to the modernists for the anchor leg of the relay. The pre-modern European past of the late Middle Ages and the Reformation era is assumed to have been left behind, explanatorily important to what immediately followed it, but not to the present. I think this supersessionist conception of historical change is mistaken in crucial respects, and my entire book is directed against it. I don't dispute the enormity of the transition from pre-modern to modern in the ways I just mentioned. Who could? Or the importance of historicism as a necessary safeguard against anachronism. But it does not follow that we can therefore dispense with the distant past if we want to understand the present. I reject the idea and the practice that we should regard the pre-modern past as over and done with, a bygone epoch against which modern <coughs> institutions and ideologies define themselves and which they have transcended and left behind. I sought to make the starting point of my book as flatly descriptive as possible. Indeed, I think it risks mere banality to begin simply by stating that human life in North America and Europe in the early 21st century is characterized by an enormous range of divergent and incompatible truth claims, whether ex explicit or implicit, about values, meaning, morality, purpose, and priorities. And these different claims are usually related to how people seem to live, at least insofar as their economic means and their political circumstances permit, permit them to do so. Different people claim different things are true. They care about different things. They pursue divergent aspirations. They regard discrepant activities as meaningful and so forth, many of which conflict with and indeed are antithetical to one another, and some of which are politically and socially divisive. Insofar as the past has made the present what it is, any adequate historical explanation must be able to account for all of these views and positions, regardless of their content or how all these truth claims and the behaviors to which they're related are held or relinquished, hybridized or adapted. I'm concerned then with doing explanatory justice to the full range of the first person plural, we, when used as a collective and inclusive designation for contemporary Europeans and North Americans. The content of we determines what needs to be explained in terms of contemporary ideological realities. Here, the most common problem, or a common problem, it seems to me, is the tendency to generalize in a way that fails to do justice to the empirical diversity of what contemporary human beings believe and care about. Charles Taylor, for example, in characterizing contemporary Westerners in his widely acclaimed 2007 book, A Secular Age, wrote that, quote, we all shunt between two stances in our views about religious belief and unbelief. This will not do because many millions of people, from divergently devout religious believers to militant despisers of religion, for example, seem not to be doing anything of the sort. To all appearances, and on the contrary, they seem confidently convinced that their respective rival views are correct, not sharing the self-conscious ambivalence or the self-relativizing skepticism that indeed characterizes other contemporaries. Nor, for example, <coughs> will the we in the subtitle of the recent collection edited by George Levine suffice, The Joy of Secularism, 11 Essays for How We Live Now, 
especially will this not suffice in the United States, where the large majority of citizens are religious believers of one sort or another. Who are we? If it's empirically inclusive, the pronoun has to encompass skinhead racists and Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity, Angela Merkel and Lady Gaga, Old Order Amish and New Atheists, Hugh Hefner and Pope Francis. There's a juxtaposition. <laughs> Not because these are typical male and female Westerners, but because all of them, like all of us, are by definition equally the product of historical processes. So any adequate historical explanation of the present has to be able to account for all of them and for the full range of different worldviews, values, and commitments that people in fact hold, whether explicitly or implicitly, coherently or confusedly. It must also be able to account for the ways in which they hold their views, as well as for the full spectrum of ways in which people modify and adapt them. One of the central arguments in my book is that the ideological heterogeneity of the Western world today is an extraordinarily complex, tangled product of rejections, retentions, and transformations of medieval Western Christianity, in which the Reformation era constitutes the fundamental watershed. For the doctrinally, socially, and politically divisive disagreements about what is true, how one ought to live, what matters most in life, and so forth, that emerged first within a Christian context and characterized the Reformation era from its outset in the early 1520s have never gone away. They've rather been transformed, modified, and expanded in terms of content and character, even as efforts have been made to contain and manage their unintended and unprecedentedly enormous effects. Because late medieval Christianity was, for better or worse, an, an institutionalized worldview, rather than something separate and separable from the rest of life called religion, the unwanted persistence of early modern Christian pluralism precipitated subsequent ideological and institutional changes which, taken together, explain the heterogeneity of North America and Europe in the early 21st century. This ideologically uh, heterogeneous reality is today contained by and incubated within the hegemonic institutions, most importantly liberal sovereign nation states and the markets, market symbiosis of post-Fordist capitalism and consumerism that protect a formal ethics of individual rights originally pioneered in the United States and which now, with national variations, characterizes every country in the Western world. Virtually universal participation in an acquisitive consumerist ethos provides the most important cultural glue which functions to hold together the ideological hyperpluralism. Judging from the consumer behavior reflected in statistics for spending and economic growth, it is correctly assumed by corporate executives, marketing specialists, and economists that the vast majority of people want more and better stuff, whatever their beliefs, whether at the income level of consumers at Bloomingdale's or Walmart. Contemporary hyperpluralism includes an enormous range of rival religious as well as secular truth claims that offer answers to questions about matters of meaning and morality, purpose and priorities, what I refer to in the book as life questions. Although some scholars in recent decades have expressed a certain astonishment that religion is back, what's actually astonishing is that it was ever have thought to have departed, apart from those who believed the classic theorists of modernization and secularization, that these were somehow prophecies destined to come true. Religion is part of contemporary Western hyperpluralism, not only as a social fact, which is indisputable, but also in the form of intellectually viable religious worldviews, compatible with all the findings of the natural sciences, which is often disputed, although typically without sufficient attention to the intellectual issues involved. Because intellectually sophisticated theology, philosophy of religion, and historicist but not skeptical biblical scholarship are part of contemporary ideological heterogeneity, an adequate account of the present must include them. They are part of the world in which we live today, despite having been banished from virtually all research universities. In the book, I show in chapter one, not only how mistaken views about the alleged incompatibility between re revealed religion and science emerged historically, but also in chapter six, how they are reinforced through the institutionalized exclusion of substantive religious claims from secularized higher education. 
Both phenomena are part of the unintended long-term effects of the unresolved doctrinal disagreements of the Reformation era. By the 17th century, the standoffs had left reason almost always combined with univocal metaphysical assumptions and Occam's razor as the only supra-confessional means of approaching the relationship between God and the natural world. Meanwhile, unintended doctrinal pluralism problematized the epistemological status of Christian truth claims and paved the way for their exclusion as unverifiable opinions from any place in universities, dominated by the end of the 19th century by the epistemological and metaphysical assumptions of the newly preeminent natural sciences. The status of the sciences was secured in part through the technological applicability of their findings in national estates to agricultural innovations and industrial manufacturing, which produced the material things that consumers wanted. It's a dynamic going stronger than ever today. I've said some things now about what I'm trying to do with the book methodologically and why, out of the desire to understand the world we're living in today, I have included in an explanatorily substantive way a longer term historical past than most of us tend to assume is necessary. I'll now try to give some sense, in very brief compass, of how we are living in a world in which everyone is still being influenced by the Reformation era, whether or not they're aware of it. That a religious revolution would, do, li would lead to the secularization of society is obviously a paradox, and it's not what any of the leaders of the Reformation sought in the 16th century. The first thing to be said, then, is that the Reformation's influence on the eventual secularization of society was complex, anything but immediate, mostly indirect, and very much unintended, hence the subtitle of my book. This influence was not, in my view, Weberian. I regard as mistaken the fairly common position, of which there are many variations, that a once enchanted and magical medieval worldview was disenchanted and secularized through something either inherent in Protestantism or intrinsic to modern science. Indeed, this is one common form of supersessionist narrative of modern Western history that does not do justice <coughs> to the present because, among other things, it ignores the continuing intellectual viability of contemporary religious worldviews that I mentioned a moment ago. The Reformation, per se, did not disenchant the world or secularize society. 16th century Protestant writings are filled with references to divine providence and presence. Those who rejected the authority of the Roman Church in the 16th century sought to address its long-standing problems in order to make all of human life more genuinely Christian than it had been. This had been a pressing concern among many reformers within the Roman Church throughout the later Middle Ages, from Catherine of Siena in the 1370s until Erasmus in the 15-teens. What happened instead, as a result of Protestant reformers' actions, but very much against their intentions, was a long-term, variegated, complex process of the disembedding of Christianity from the rest of life. A corollary of this process was the emergence of the familiar conception of religion as something separate and separable, distinct and distinguishable from public life, because it came to be regarded essentially as a matter of individuals' interior beliefs plus their preferred worship and devotional practices for two principal reasons for this process of disembedding. First, the turn to scripture alone, to the Bible as a supposedly self-sufficient and perspicuous basis for Christian faith and life, independent in principle of ecclesiastical tradition and the Roman Church's authority, yielded nothing remotely resembling a <coughs> consensus about the meaning and implications of God's word. Had it done so, the history of the Reformation and of Protestantism since the 16th century would have looked radically different. Instead, from the very beginning of the German Reformation in the early 1520s, the turn to scripture produced an open-ended and ongoing range of rival truth claims about what God's word meant. As 16th century Christians were well aware, but some ecumenically minded Christians today seem to have forgotten, the principle of non-contradiction meant that it was impossible for all of these conflicting truth claims actually to be true wherever they contradicted one another. This meant not only, or this meant, sorry, not all of them could belong to knowledge. A fact that eventually, after a long early modern interlude in which theology was politically privileged and insulated in the universities and academies of rival confessional regimes, 
would contribute to the secularization of knowledge and the exclusion of theology from universities. Religious studies departments would eventually be installed in the place of theology and divinity faculties, with religion studied on the basis of the same naturalist met methodological and metaphysical assumptions that govern the pursuit of modern knowledge in all academic disciplines. In the Reformation era, disagreements about Christian truth among rival antagonists produce literally endless doctrinal controversy in great abundance, as anyone familiar with the sources of the period knows. Attempts to overcome the unsought pluralism by different interpretations of the biblical text, appeals to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, new revelation from God, or the use of discursive reason, in fact only augmented the pluralism and provided more things about which Christians could and did disagree. Unintended early modern Protestant heterogeneity is thus the most <coughs> important distance source for contemporary Western hyperpluralism because these sorts of disagreements about answers to the life questions have never gone away. We simply experience them now in different forms and with many more rival, secular, as well as religious truth claims in a liberal institutional context that permits and protects them, and per permits and protects them all rather than privileging one or prohibiting any, so long as their respective protagonists obey the law. The Reformation sought a return to the pure word of God, uncluttered by human traditions, pagan philosophies, and clerical manipulations. It resulted instead in a profusion of competing truth claims about the Bible's meaning and God's will that problematized the epistemological status of the truth claims and raised the prospect of radical doctrinal skepticism and relativism via pluralism already in the 1520s. Whoever has gone astray in the faith may thereafter believe whatever he wants to. Everything is equally valid. This remark from 1526 was made not by somebody defending the Roman church against the dangers of Protestant individualism. That's Martin Luther railing against Huldrych Zwingli. Most Reformation scholars ordinarily think about their field rather differently, distinguishing sharply between the politically supported and therefore influential magisterial Reformation and the usually suppressed and therefore numerically, socially, and politically marginal radical reformation. To be sure, only two Protestant traditions exerted a widespread, long-lasting early modern influence, Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism, in which here, for the sake of simplicity, I include the post-Henrician and non-Marian Church of England. Even though there were hundreds of divergent and rival anti-Roman interpretations of scripture in the Reformation era and beyond, but here is an instance in which an integrative cross-confessional approach to the Reformation era can shed new light by helping to correct historiographical oversights. The biblical interpretation and the exercise of power are two different things. They should not be conflated, but rather distinguished for the purposes of historical understanding. When we do that, we see that Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism, again, including the Church of England and what we can call Anglicanism, starting with the Restoration of 1660, were actually the great exceptions of the Reformation, just the opposite of the way in which they've usually been and still tend to be regarded, precisely because from among all the various anti-Roman interpretations of God's word, only they secured the enduring support of political authorities in their respective cities, territories, and countries. Unlike all other anti-Roman Christians, Lutherans and Reformed Protestants had political refuges in which they were not proscribed, persecuted, and punished. The Radical Reformation was important not because, aside from the German Peasants' War, the Anabaptist Kingdom of Munster, the English Revolution, it had any widespread social, cultural, or political impact in the Reformation era, but because it shows us what the Reformation as such produced in the absence of control by confessional authorities. The same open-ended heterogeneity of divergent views about the meaning of God's word is evident in a radically different political context in modern liberal states, which of course deliberately avoid confessional prescriptions. Only when we historically reintegrate the radical with the magisterial reformation, and we distinguish the rejection of the Roman church from the exercise of political power, does the significance of the appeal to the Bible become clear within the reformation as a whole. That Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism were politically supported and therefore socially influential in a way analogous to the Catholic Church in its territories in the Dominican.
is no reason to regard either as theologically or exegetically normative, as if justification by faith alone, through grace alone, were therefore true and somehow the clear cornerstones of restored Christian doctrine. Certainly, early modern Mennonites and Phanalists and Socinians did not agree. Scripture alone, unfettered and unconstrained and lacking political oversight, produced an open-ended range of rival truth claims about what Christianity was and implied. Scripture interpreted by hermeneutic authorities with the backing of political authorities produced confessional cities, territories, and states, analogous to early modern Catholic confessional regimes. Even more influentially, the on and off religious political conflicts between the 1520s and the 1640s, especially those between magisterial Protestants and Catholics in different regions of Europe, were the second main reason for the eventual disembedding of Christianity from the rest of life pursuant to the Reformation. Much to the chagrin of Protestant leaders, the papal antichrist and its kingdom did not crumble as a prelude to the apocalypse, as many of them expected. On the contrary, after the Council of Trent especially, Roman Catholicism regrouped in Europe and solidified its spread around the world, from New France in North America to the Philippines in Asia. And much to the dismay of Catholic leaders, the Protestant Reformation demonstrated its staying power. Unlike those groups of medieval dissenters, Albigensians, Valdensians, Lollards, and Hussites, that Roman church leaders working with non-ecclesiastical authorities had managed through suppression at least to contain and control. But because what was at stake was so important, God's truth and the prospect of eternal life in the hereafter, as well as the right ordering and flourishing of human life in the present, faith commitments played a part in the motivations of many rulers and their involvement in the religio-political conflicts from the Koppel Wars of 1529 to 31 in Switzerland through the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil Wars of the 1640s. These conflicts were destructive, expensive, and inconclusive. No Reformation-era rulers who engaged in them were able to achieve their main goals in any lasting manner, nor were they able to eliminate to their satisfaction those dissenters who subverted their aims of creating Christian moral communities coextensive with rulers' respective political communities. Instead, resolute confessionalizing efforts, although welcomed by the willingly devout, helped to foster reservoirs of resentment precisely among the resistant whose conformity was sought. This would provide a crucial part of the background for the dominant liberationist narrative of modernity, viewed as a trajectory from oppressive pre-modern restrictiveness to modern individual autonomy. First forged in different Enlightenment national contexts, and no less evident today in various postmodern manifestations. By the mid 17th century, there were strong incentives to discover or fashion persuasive ideological substitutes for Christianity that would be capable of transcending deadlocked doctrinal controversies <coughs> and the revival of Peronian skepticism to which they contributed. The most important and influential of these new substitutes was foundationalist philosophy, beginning with Descartes. But the failure of modern philosophy to provide consensual, substantive answers to the life questions through reason alone, just as the Reformation had sought but failed to provide such answers through scripture alone, had by the late 20th century left considerable skeptical wreckage in its wake. Indeed, one might say that after a long detour led by modern philosophy, a central thrust of much postmodernism represents a return of the early modern skepticism that modern philosophy sought but failed to overcome, having instead replicated in a rationalist register the unintended pluralism of Protestantism. But the eventual solution to unintended rival truth claims about what to believe and how to live would be not religious or philosophical, but rather institutional. Indeed, by the early 17th century, some institutional arrangements were emerging that looked like they might provide an alternative to confessionalization and the prospect of future rounds of religio-political conflict. In the 1580s, urban leaders in that strange new neo-medieval polity, the Dutch Republic, began experimenting in the direction opposite to the confessionalizing ambitions characteristic of so many other rulers. They were keenly aware of the ongoing conflicts between Catholics and Huguenots in France, and wary of militant Calvinism no less than of Catholicism. Hence, they privileged Reformed Protestantism as the public church, but they did not make it the state religion. 
No one was compelled to attend its services or belong to its communities of faith. And in fact, throughout the United Provinces, Reformed Protestants long constituted a minority, in some instances a tiny minority, of the population. Employing a de facto distinction between public and private space, the Dutch were essentially, if implicitly, defining something new, religion. Considered as a matter of individually preferred interior beliefs, worship, and practices of devotion, and therefore separable from the rest of life. The English ambassador to the United Provinces, William Temple, described the effects in 1673. The power of religion among them, the Dutch, where it is, lies in every man's heart. The appearance of it is but like a piece of humanity, by which everyone falls most into the company or conversation of those whose customs and humors, whose talk and disposition they like best. And as in other places, tis in every man's choice with whom he will eat or lodge, with whom go to market or to court. So it seems to be here with whom he will pray or go to church or associate in the service or worship of God. Nor is any more notice taken of what everyone chooses in these cases than in the other. Here, Christianity, or to use Temple's more abstract term, religion, has been subjectivized, interiorized, and compartmentalized. With Temple and others in the late 17th century, we see early articulations of what would turn out to be the institutional solution for domesticating a disruptive, divided Christendom. Society, the public life of power and politics, economic transactions, and non-ecclesiastical institutions, and all other normal, non-sectarian social interactions, had in principle, at least embryonically, found its way free from religion which was simultaneously becoming something separable from the rest of human life. Such a society would doubtless be quite different from the forms of human life it was displacing, because Christianity itself was being radically redefined as a restricted matter of individual preference in place of something intended to inform shared public life. But as long as divided Christians continued to share so many other beliefs in common about morality, familial duty, participation in civic life, and so forth, the public effects of the de facto toleration being pioneered by the Dutch would at first remain relatively minor. Disembedding of this sort, then, was a gradual, long-term process, very different from, say, the violent de-Christianization of the French Revolution in 1793-94. Increased religious toleration was good for business. One of the crucial developments that facilitated Christianity's gradual disembedding, a development intertwined with the innovative political practices of the Dutch, was their emergence as a maritime commercial power. And indeed, as Jan de Vries and Ad van der Waerde would have it, participants in the first modern economy. In critical ways, Dutch practices of acquisitiveness represented a departure from traditional Christian views about the dangers of avarice and the pursuit of wealth views that had been expressed with copious reference to scripture among Lutheran, Reformed Protestant, and radical Protestant leaders of the 16th century. But understandably, and especially after the cataclysm of the Thirty Years' War, part of their own Eighty Years' War with the Spanish, the Dutch were not the only Christians who demonstrated their preference for shopping over doctrinal controversy and possible further rounds of religio-political conflict. So they and many other Northwestern Christians across confessional lines became participants in what de Vries has called the Industrious Revolution, the household-based combination of harder, longer work to support increasing desires for the things that money could buy in the pursuit of comfort and enjoyment across an unprecedentedly wide swath of the population, beginning in the mid-17th century and later providing ballast for the Industrial Revolution. Thus did Catholics and Protestants both begin willingly to permit their self-colonization by consumption and capitalism in a sharp departure from traditional Christian views about acquisitiveness. This was not an entirely new development, of course, but part of a much longer trend that in previous centuries had had a much smaller social base. Medieval popes and members of the Curia, as well as rulers and nobles, plus the worldly-minded Renaissance merchants, princes, and courtiers studied by Lisa Jardine. Besides the expansion of the social base to embrace many more households, first in the Dutch Republic, what distinguished the 17th and the 18th century was the, the, the deliberate redefinition 
of acquisitiveness as something good, something positive. Whether it was viewed as part of God's providence among the 18th century New England Protestant ministers and merchants, recently studied by Mark Valeri, essentially the distant ancestors of today's proponents of the prosperity gospel, or whether it was defended as an ostensibly inherent characteristic of human nature by thinkers such as Mandeville, Montesquieu, or Hume. <clears throat> Increasingly, the desire for more and better stuff was regarded not as a sinful propensity to seek the fulfillment of one's own superfluous wants at the expense of meeting others' most basic needs, to be resisted through ascetic self-denial, but rather as an unavoidable and therefore acceptable aspect of universal human nature whose effects would be benign and beneficial. In this respect, modern capitalism and consumerism should be seen less as an outgrowth of either Reformation era Protestantism or Catholicism than as an alternative to and a rejection of both. The impetus for which was influenced considerably by the failures of Reformation era rulers to achieve their military and political objectives. What was adumbrated in the United Provinces of the Netherlands and channeled through Britain's Dutch apprenticeship was first and most influentially institutionalized in the United States in the late 18th century among men and women who had been much more thoroughly enculturated in the Industrious Revolution, not only in port cities such as Boston and Philadelphia, but as Ansvard Martin has recently shown even in the rural backcountry of Virginia. But widespread acquisitiveness was only part of the picture institutional political solution was also important in order to address the issues raised by the colony's religious pluralism inherited from the Reformation era. In the Virginia debates in December 1784 about whether the state should continue to support publicly and financially the Anglican Church as it had throughout the colonial era, James Madison's notes reflected the persistent relevance of issues that had vexed Europeans and now impinged on Americans since the 1520s. Here's Madison. In what light are the biblical books to be viewed? As dictated every letter by inspiration, or the essential parts only, or the matter in general, not the words? What sense the true one? For if some doctrines be essential to Christianity, those who reject these, whatever name they take, are no Christian society. Is it Trinitarianism, Arianism, Socinianism? Is it salvation by faith or works also? by free grace or free will, etc., etc., etc. The solution, in retrospect, seems simple and obvious, namely to permit everyone to believe as they pleased and worship as they wished, in exchange for obedience to the state's laws, essentially a democratization of Luther's Here I Stand, but combined with a widespread agreement about the meaning and the much narrowed scope of religion, prompted by the disruption of the Reformation era. What William Temple had observed about the Dutch in the 1670s was thus elevated by Madison into a maxim. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. So long as they obeyed the state's laws, citizens could believe whatever they wanted, at least in principle, and worship or not as they wished. As Thomas Paine saw clearly already in 1794, my own mind is my own church. The principal founding documents of the United States are deliberately formal and empty with respect to answers to the life questions. Americans were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there was no mention of how one ought to live, how freedom should be exercised, or even in what the pursuit of happiness consisted. That was deliberately left in individual discretion even though shared public life continued to depend in large measure and in practice on the substantive values and virtues that Americans absorb through the most important institutions responsible for inculcating them, namely churches and families, whose members were, in John Butler's phrase, a wash in a sea of faith. A formal ethics of politically protected individual rights, not a substantive ethics of the good over which Christians had been quarreling so consequentially since the Reformation era, would provide the framework for public morality in the United States, even though it continued to depend for its substantive content on vigorous, mostly Protestant churches, the influence of which increased beginning with the evangelical revival of the 1790s. The federal disestablishment of churches could and did work as well as it did because of this symbiotic relationship. 
The effects of this symbiosis struck Tocqueville during his American visit in the early 1830s. There is an innumerable multitude of sects in the United States, that's CTS. When I say this to students, they always start to get excited, and I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> An innumerable multitude of sects in the United States. They are all different in the worship they offer to the Creator, but all agree concerning the duties of men to one another. That is, their members shared a sense of the moral responsibilities and obligations that could and did inform public life, despite Federalist <coughs> establishment of churches and the institutional separation of church and state. Tocqueville continues, each sect worships God in its own fashion, but all preach the same morality in the name of God. Indeed, all sects in the United States belong to the great unity of Christendom, and Christian morality is everywhere the same. So, as a contingent sociological fact, the large majority of Americans happened still to share a moral outlook that informed public life at the time. Which meant the religion, as Tocqueville well famously said, should therefore be considered as the first of their political institutions. In effect, disestablishment and freedom of religion were contributing to the cohesion that early modern European confessional regimes had sought to achieve through frequently coercive established churches. But the subsequent history of the West has demonstrated the instability of this social reality and its political effects. The country's underlying political and legal framework was deliberately without prescriptive content about the life questions, and it protected individual rights because of the enduring doctrinal disagreements and their correlative social divisiveness inherited from Reformation. Individuals had to be protected because individuals disagreed about what was true and how to live. To be sure, public social life, politics, and morality could continue to be influenced by religion under the terms of disestablishment and the political protection of individual religious freedom. But they would actually be so influenced only if individual citizens, in fact, exercised their freedom in ways that concretely shaped domains of life that were, in principle, officially insulated. If citizens started collectively and habitually behaving differently, say, through the intensification of consumption practices that had marked American life since the colonial era, resulting in recent decades, what Stephen Bowman has analyzed as a distinctly consumerist rather than a merely industrial society, if citizens started changing their behaviors in those ways, the influence of religion on public life would change accordingly. Without mentioning changes as important as the advent of post darwinian Protestant fundamentalism after the Civil War, this is what I would suggest has happened in the U.S., especially since World War II and most visibly since the 1960s. Religion has not gone away, nor have most Americans stopped self-identifying as Christians of one sort or another, but nothing besides consumerism has taken the place of any shared, substantive, politically and socially efficacious views about how people ought to live, how they should exercise their freedom, and how happiness ought to be pursued. What Tocqueville observed in the 1830s is emphatically no longer the case. Americans do not agree even about their basic duties to one another, nor do they all preach the same morality. In contrast to Western European countries, religion is still omnipresent in the US, but it no longer informs American society at large in any coherent way because religious believers as a whole are divided on every socially and morally significant issue in ways that tend to reflect the American political system. <coughs> in the wake of the dissolution and the dismantling of the Protestant moral establishment recently analyzed by David Sahat, individuals are free to define and determine the good for themselves and to live as they please within the state's laws. So long as they're politically quiescent, you can believe whatever you want live however you please, change what you believe and how you live however you wish, for whatever reason or for no reason, without regard for anyone else. It's all up to you. Individual choice is the summum bonum. The empirical result is our contemporary hyperpluralism. It's attended political frictions and factions, and what seems to be growing incivility in public life in recent decades. One corollary, it seems to me, is the absence of shared assumptions about values in the absence of shared assumptions about values, priorities, moralities, and meaning is the current level of our bumper sticker political discourse in what Tony Grafton has recently called our poisoned public sphere, a discourse that is short on rigor but filled with rancor 
even among most of that minority of citizens that seems still to evince a serious concern with politics. But why should we care about the lives and problems of people we don't know? Those outsourced laborers in China and Mexico who make all the stuff we buy, or the urban poor in our own country? Well, we can go to the mall instead, or simply go online and pull out the credit card for a little retail therapy. Ignoring others is perfectly constitutional. It's how we can choose to live in exercising our liberty in the pursuit of happiness. Even though American per capita income increased eightfold in real terms during the 20th century, we are now living in a society without an inquisitive ceiling, in which there is literally no such thing as too much, provided one has the financial means to do as one pleases. This is the latter day secularized outcome of early modern Christians' self colonization by capitalism and consumption which now functions within our legal and political system to hold together the hyperpluralism that is the unintended latter-day ideological outcome of the Reformation in Europe. To be sure, I want to be clear about this, modern liberalism solved the serious problem of coexistence among contentious Christians and the failure of antagonistic confessional rulers to achieve their objectives. At the same time, the rights it protects have facilitated more than the solution to a political problem. Consider the relationship between consumerism as an expression of the exercise of individual rights and the environmental impact of the industrial manufacturing that produces all that stuff, including the world's petroleum-powered vehicles. Of course, we can always hope that the findings <laughs> pertaining to climate change from so many teams of scientists and so many different disciplines from around the world have nothing to do with human activity that we are simply experiencing another upswing in the Earth's natural warming and cooling cycles. But if what we are really seeing is the cumulative effect of acquisitive human desires on the natural world itself, it would turn out to be the ultimate subversion of some of the most basic dominant assumptions of Western modernity. That the acquisitiveness, sanctioned for centuries as rational self-interest and the high road to human happiness, is actually endangering the biosphere that makes all human and other life possible. Small wonder, then, that some defenders of individual rights and free enterprise are keen to dismiss concerns about global warming as politically motivated hot air. Yeah. By way of conclusion, I will briefly circle back to the issue of historians' division of labor and our conceptualization of historical change. Historians tend to see Reformation history, the history of early modern European political thought, early American political history, American economic history, contemporary global environmental history as separate fields. Indeed, they are. But the reality of the historical past, made the real present in which we're living, ignores the boundaries that we draw between those fields. That is why, if we want to understand the present, we have to transgress those fields too, with a historical approach and a method that can explain the world we're living in and where it came from. In however inadequate, abbreviated fashion, I hope I've conveyed some impression of how I've tried to go about this in my book, which explores in considerably more detail much more than I've been able to understand.